Good afternoon, I'm coming to you from Andersonville, Georgia. I'm here at the Andersonville National Historic Site. We're gonna check the place out, hear some stories about what took place on the grounds that are here. And also as part of the Andersonville site is the National Prisoner of War Museum, which is the building that you see directly behind me. So we're gonna check out the museum, check out the National Cemetery, check out the Andersonville historical site itself. Let's go make some memories. Here is part of the Andersonville site. We've got the National Prisoner of War Museum. It says this building is a memorial to all Americans held as prisoners of war. So it's relating to all wars everywhere. So this is a museum in their honor. Thank you. So this is talking about the Buffalo Soldiers and the National Park Service. Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 opened the door for African Americans to enlist in the military. In 1866, there were six black regiments established by Congress who were nicknamed the Buffalo Soldiers. That was their pen. Charles Young, who was a leader of one of the Buffalo Soldiers regiments. I know it's kind of showing up weird because of the glare. And when you come to this, the National Prisoner of War Museum here as part of the Andersonville site, there are restrooms, vending machines, and currently because of COVID, they do still have the mask mandate. You have to wear a mask when you're inside the building. There's a lot of old mementos in here. Wow, there was a U.S. Marine who wore this when he was a prisoner of war in Japan during World War II. One POW's flight suit. Rhonda Corn, Flying Tigers. This is the flight suit she wore when she was shot down during the Persian Gulf War in 1991. She was held for eight days as a prisoner of war with two broken arms and a dislocated knee. Wow. And there she is right there when she was able to make it home. I'm not gonna show you guys every little detail of everything in here because I want you guys to come and visit this place for yourself and take it all in. Wow, look at those poor guys up there, how skinny they were. Malnourished and skinny from not being able to eat properly, being a prisoner. Somebody being shot down right there. The plane only has one wing on it and the other wing's falling. Oh, that's an amazing photograph. Stay in line, don't break rank. Prisoners being told to stay in line. I know everything's not coming out the greatest in here because it's dark, so I apologize for that. This is a really nice museum. It says, hands over, hand over all your personal belongings. It does not come out, it's too dark in here. No eating, no drinking, no talking. Some of these old notes that people wrote back to their families when they were captured. It says here, I won't say much as it'll be censored anyway. So they had to write in codes. Communicating with mute code. That way they can keep in touch with each other without anybody knowing what they're doing. They use sign language. That's smart. places people would be held in the lockup of Halloween. Since we christened this tiny dungeon Alcatraz, even though we were all kept in locked cells and locked irons, locked leg irons within those cells except at midday, <coughs> excuse me, the Vietnamese seemed convinced we would be figure a way to escape. There was never an instant when our little court did not have at least one armed guard. There is a lot to look at here. It's talking about women in battle. Escape attempts, which is interesting. It says the majority of people that tried to escape from the Anderson Falls site only were successful if they ran. People who tried to tunnel were usually either caught because the tunnel would collapse in on them, or somebody would turn on and turn them in. Okay, outside the back of the Prisoner of War Museum is this. This is really neat on this wall here. This 
guy that's here barefoot just begging for his freedom okay it says this was andersonville it says you're about to enter andersonville one of the largest confederate prisoner of war camps 45,000 Union soldiers were held here. 13,000 almost died. Beyond a walking tour of the stockade area, which you see over here, a visit to Andersonville involves an inner journey to imagine prisoners' existence here and discover the meaning of the place that fragments that remain. Throughout the site, there are clues to a high rate of mortality. And here's kind of a little bit of a map of what's here. The inner stockades and monuments, hospital sites. And that's this whole area that you see out here. Okay, this is talking about earthwork defenses. What they mean by earthwork is where these are man-made by piling up all the dirt and debris to make a basically a protection wall. You can see the cannons behind it there so that they could fire out and over and be protected by incoming fire would hit into this wall that they built to protect themselves. This is a very, very beautiful site. Unfortunately, it sucks to know that there was so much so much death here, so much hatred here. There's like a one-way drive that you can do around the grounds here at Andersonville. Um, you already saw the cemetery that we went through, the National Cemetery. This is like, inside there, there was uh, memorials to a lot of the northern states that were there. Like this one's for Wisconsin. It says this monument was erected by the state of Wisconsin in grateful remembrance to her sons who suffered and died in Andersonville prison from eight, March 1864 to April 1865, so about 13 months. And then you see there's other memorials up here as well. There's Rhode Island is this next one that's here. Massachusetts. Ohio, where I'm from. There's just several of these around this, around this area for each state, which is nice. Nice remembrance. 
All right, this is talking about the Stockade Branch. This stream, a branch of Sweetwater Creek, was the prison's water supply. Today's neatly dredged channel is misleading. When the prison was built, the Stockade both slowed the current, turning the, st the stream into a basic stagnant swamp. The prisoners' latrines also went downstream, so overcrowding soon fouled the water, and the sluggish current failed to wash sewage out of the prison. The stream's bacteria quickly became lethal. So there was a lot of people who... There were a lot of people who drank the water here who got sick and, and died. And one of the stories here is that there's multiple stories about Providence Spring, which is where we're heading right now. Some people say that a lightning bolt came down and struck the ground and water started coming out of the ground. Spring water that was clean and, and, and pure, so they were able to drink it and survive. And then Providence Spring became an area where people used to travel and come visit this and drink the water from the spring. Here on the top, this says it was the North Gate. It says the trail follows in the footsteps of the newly arriving prisoners. Captured Union soldiers marched from the village railroad past this spot and uphill to the North Gate, which you see up here, which was the main prison entrance. After prisoners passed through the outer door, it was barred behind them. Then inner gates swung open on the prison yard. New arrivals or fresh fish, as they were often called, had no idea what awaited them here. I can't even imagine. We're gonna walk up to that north gate in just a second. But first we're gonna check out Providence Spring. It says, during a heavy rainstorm, August 14th, 1864, a spring suddenly gushed from this hillside. The prisoners were desperate for fresh water and over time the event became legendary. Several main cla men claimed to have seen a lightning strike right on this spot just before the spring burst forth. This damp slope with its many natural seeps would appear to be a likely site for a spring. Workmen have been inadvertently buried the spring's outlet while digging the stockade trench. Whether an act of nature or divine providence, the effect of the stream was an answer to thousands of prayers. And that's why they named it Providence Spring. And as you can see, inside here, the spring is still, the spring water is still flowing. They built this in 1901. It says, with charity to all and malice toward none. Nice cold spring water. This says, a tight stockade. It's talking about how the people were. This was built so tight. But it was way overcrowded. It even mentions it here. The Confederates' original plan broke down under a wave of overcrowding. The contrasting stockade walls suggest things had begun to go terribly wrong by the summer of 1864. Ah, the history that's taking place on this site. It says world of lost spirits when the inner gate swung open new prisoners had their first vision of life inside the noise the smell the crowd of emancipated men desperate for news must have been overwhelming new arrivals known as fresh fish anything of value money buttons clothing might be conned or stolen from them even worse was the sight of other prisoners in skeletal forms and lifeless eyes a new prisoner could foresee his own fate that has to be absolutely terrifying. So I just walked from over here. This is like what's called the Star Fort. It says within this stronghold stood the offices of the Post Commandment and Prison Commandment. Fort and headquarters were symbols of power, but fully enclosed earthworks reflect the authorities besieged state of mind. Hampered by supply shortages and a constant influx of new prisoners, the Confederates here were responsible for operating a prison camp under conditions that they could barely control. Four of the Star Fort's guns were trained outward to repel Union cavalry raids. The other five cannons were aimed toward the north slope of the prison camp. So that's the north gate back there in Providence Spring. Way over there. And then see two of the cannons are aimed that way. So this is where the Confederates kind of held their their power structure stayed up here away from the camp and it says about being besieged they were always worried they were going to be attacked 
and rightfully so. I mean, this was a huge prison camp, so of course the Union was going to try and get their people back, always. This sign that's coming up here is talking about pigeon roofs. Had nothing to do with the birds that just flew by. They're talking about the tower that's up here. The soldiers would climb up onto that tower so they could look down over the fence into the encampment, into the prison. It says they were mounted every hundred feet atop the stockade. The guards had orders to shoot any prisoner who crossed the deadline. Otherwise, they had little control over the conditions inside. They're showing you a drawing here of one of the guards looking down at all the prisoners that were being held here. You can see they have two of them built. They have two of the pigeon roofs built. One there and one over here. And then this is the deadline that they're talking about. So if you were to cross this point right here, like I just did, the guard in that tower and the guard in that tower would be firing at me with orders shoot to kill. Because they didn't want any prisoner that was inside here. Because they were outnumbered. They had more prisoners than they had guards here. So they were under the orders to shoot at will and shoot to kill as soon as somebody crossed their little stockade deadline that they built because if prisoners could get past that without their lives being threatened it was only a matter of time before you'd get enough prisoners to help and boost each other out and get over that wall not everybody and then once you're over that wall you could overtake the guards potentially if you have enough people so that's why they had those strict orders to do that it's just a shame that it's just a shame that in general that, that everything had to come to war, but the results of the Civil War were positive and that they ended slavery. Negative that it tore families apart. You had brother versus brother, north versus south. Everybody's seen those shows, those documentaries that talk about the Civil War. And it's just a shame overall, but it was it was a, a right that had to correct a wrong in American history. And it just makes you really thankful that you didn't live in those times. We're so blessed to live. People complain now all the time. Oh, it's 2022. Everything sucks. I hate the president. I hate my politicians. My job sucks. Everything else. Trust me. There was a lot worse things that you could be complaining about. We're blessed to live in the time that we live in. The time period we live in, we're blessed. The technology. I mean, look at this. I'm standing here in Andersonville, Georgia using equipment to film this and be able to bring this and present this to you this powerful experience it's a blessing to be able to do all this and unfortunately war is a something we have to have to have freedom unfortunately it's just the way the world works and it sucks but it is what it is but like i said can you imagine living in this whether it's 30 degrees in the winter and freezing cold or 90 degrees anybody who's been to south georgia knows it gets hot and very humid and very muggy here and it rains a lot in the summer as well you imagine being here in the in the rain in the heat right now today it's a beautiful day it's like 60 60 degrees i'm out here in a polo shirt and pants and it's nice but can you imagine but i'm also not living out here i'm filming this and i'm about to hop back in my car but i just appreciate each and every one of you for watching And I'm glad to be able to bring history to you and learn a lot right along with you because I'm not from the South. So Andersonville I had heard of. I had heard of Providence Spring previously. But to be able to be here and experience it and learn new things about the site, truly blessed. This is going to wrap up our stop here at the Andersonville National Historic Site. Thanks you guys so much for watching and learning a little bit of history from us and with us at the same time. If you like this kind of video, hit that like button down below. If you're subscribed to the channel, thanks for watching. If not, hit that red button down below. We're over 1,800 subscribers strong now, and we appreciate each and every one of you for always watching and commenting and liking and just being here as part of our community. Share this video with anybody you know that might like Civil War history, history in general of the United States, or just might like interesting vlogs. All right, thanks for watching so much, you guys. And as always, we'll see you soon.